Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live here in theCUBE in San Francisco, California, Moscone West. CUBE's exclusive coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, your co-host. But John Troyer, my analyst co-host, he's, he's the co-founder of Tech Reckoning, an advisory and uh, community development firm. Our next guest is Marco Bill Peter, Senior Vice President, Customer Experience Engagement at Red Hat. Welcome back to theCUBE, good to see Thank you. you. So, uh, so you guys have a great track record with customer support. You guys do the gold standard in open source. You've done it for years with RHEL, very reliable. Um, it's a changing world. You know, OpenShift now, certainly the centerpiece. CoreOS, new acquisition. A lot of things happening within the portfolio. Cloud native, new capabilities are on the horizon. And so, you know, you got to figure it out. So, so what, you know, what's the support strategy? What are you guys doing? How are you looking at it? I'm sure it's challenging, but never too much of a challenge for you guys. Just smart, what's the, what's the support well, strategy? Well, I think the recipe is, uh, is really like not getting stuck in a way, right? I mean, and, and be open to, you know, like I, I think Jim Whiters in his keynote talked quite a bit about, you know, like you used to do all plan, describe, and execute. That thing just doesn't work, right? Because supporting customers on Linux, supporting them when they move to OpenShift or even application development, it's a whole different piece. So as a leader, you got to be flexible as in, okay, this is here, we do it this way, let's put more money in this, let's say OpenShift support, OpenShift you know, kind of how, what's the customer experience there, right? And kind of figuring out yes. how it works, right? And just, uh, there's a lot of things that scare me in the daily business as in like, okay, can't do that. But uh, I think uh, Red Hat is really good in reconfiguring. Jim talked about that in a keynote yeah. as well, reconfiguring the organization. And so we move, for example, quality assurance into my organization and combining that with support, all of a sudden gives you more opportunities realizing well, this product may be not ready yet for the market, right? We cannot support that. Or you augment it with, um, I wouldn't call them AI capabilities, but more like those capabilities, all of a sudden stuff gets done automatically, right? I and multi-cloud is again, just like multi-vendor environment, but it's a little bit different obviously, but multiple clouds, you have different architectures. You guys do some progressive things. What's new you know, architecturally within the support group? Because you have deals announced here with IBM and Microsoft, one of them is a joint, I think, integrated program where you guys are yeah, yeah, Microsoft, teaming up. Microsoft is interesting, right? We've teamed up uh, last three, four years, right, with the first deal and going further. You mean like putting, you know, like funny, right? I've been at Red Hat so long and you put people <laughs> to Redmond on premise, right? It's kind of funny, but it's good, right? And that's yeah. what you got to glue together. Sometimes it's people, sometimes it's also more having the data, right? I mean, if you go multi, difference between multi-vendor, multi-cloud, multi-vendor, you just call the vendor and tell them, hey, you handle it here, hot potato, you handle it. Or maybe you do it a bit better. But multi-cloud is, well, it's running there. How do you get access to that? And then the whole privacy loss comes in. So you got to be more instrumentation, uh, uh, you know, telemetry that you so get into. So using tech to help you guys out. That's what you're referring about, AI. I actually think in the next 10 years, you will see support changing quite a bit. In what way? You have to staff, but also you have to staff this up, right? You need to upskill your folks as well as technology. You've got to upskill a little bit about the both people, right? That, that doesn't go away. But I think it will go more and more that you really need deep skills. When if you want to support OpenShift, you got to either you understand it from the middleware side, from the application side, or from the bottom, from the infrastructure, but you need both skill sets. So you need really highly skilled people. But on the other hand, if it's really like real time and people don't have patience, wait two weeks still, especially if you're on the cloud. So more and more tooling. I see the vision as in, in it will be less and less well, based on the scale, but I think it's less and less people involved and more and more automation, yeah, automation. tooling on it. And you kind of see that now with bots, kind of just tipping the, tip of the iceberg, but you got automation built into the culture of Red Hat. You bought CoreOS, I mean, they want to automate everything. They got this yeah, operating framework. Ansible as well, right? Yeah. I mean, like, it, you, you see insights, right? We launched insights three years ago out of support, right? It was basically, they take support data, find out what's really happening, create rules that if you match it to customer systems, hey, you have this and this issue, right? And now it's in the center stage of the strategy as in we can automate this, and then, then you connect it to Ansible, you can automate it. You have a problem, you want to have it solved. It's eventually, like provisioning a service, you're provisioning a support service. Exactly, <laughs> and eventually will not even tell you, hey, that in maybe hindsight will tell you, hey, you had this network issue 
configured the wrong way, we fixed it, have a good time. Well, it came up in Kubernetes uh, conversations we had last week in Copenhagen, we were in Denmark for KubeCon, around you know, things, obviously Kubernetes, de facto standards, so great stuff, that's certainly great. Istio service meshes is, is a topic that's highly discussed, and one of the things that comes up is, the beautiful thing about automation, and the downside potentially is, it fixes things, right? So you could have a memory leak, for instance, that you never know gets fixed, but it just crashes every day or, and reboots itself. So the new kinds of instrumentation yeah, is emerging. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so this is really the tough job. Yeah. Right. How do you get in there? Also have automation not work against you, right? That's, that's not a... Well, and you as the central provider, right, are pulling in data from, uh, you have data from across the, the world and across the customer base. So how do, you, how do you take that, sift it, to be more proactive about decision making and support? Yeah, and so, yeah, it's good. And so we capture all this support data. And you know, like, it's fascinating. You're, we have some AI capabilities, some machine learning capabilities go through that, but it's fascinating. Sometimes we, we see new issues coming up. What we do is then we go, well, let's look who is exposed to that, just to get a footprint, and then you actually inform customers, hey, you had this and this issue, or you have this and this. It's, it's really, it's a different, and that's where I want to get more proactive or more automated. Just with the automation, I just want to be, you, you got to work, right? So we installed over the last, I would say, 18 months, like a bot. Simple bot, basically, his name is Edmund, uh, and he works on support cases. And we started slow, very slow. We didn't let it go as in totally machine learning. It's a, but now, I, I gave some stats earlier today. In one use case, it's 25% faster solving a customer issue using Edmund. Yeah. And he particip participates in 11% of all support cases Edmund is Wow, it is a, busy a huge guy. time save. It's a busy it? guy. And the game's changing too. I mean, the old days, first line support, second line support, offline support, you know, escalation, these things are older IT mechanisms. With this, you're talking about completely doing away with, in essence, first line support, but also first line support might come in from, say, a Microsoft or an IBM, so you got to be ready for it's anything. Actually, I think it's not just first line support, and it's not replacing them, it's helping them, right? It's really making them faster, right? I mean, the frustrating piece is like customer opens a support case, some data is missing, right? And so, you know, you have a queue, it gets to that, engineer looks at, oh, this data is missing. Edmund sees that and says, hey, I need this data piece. Based on other support cases, we fixed similar issues, this is the data we need. So Edmund gets the data ready, engineer looks at, in some cases, Edmund actually Close it out. Yeah. Close it out. Tell the customer, hey, there's a better solution here, do it this way. Yeah. I'd love to pull the camera back a little bit, right? You are not the SVP of support. You're the, you're the SVP of customer experience and engagement, right? That's, all, that's an entirely different role in some ways, in that you're responsible for customer success at, at some level. And that is correct. Can yeah. you talk yeah. a little bit about reconfiguring your organization to, to be that like so that? I think when we dive in a little bit on the customer success, right? So we have an organization that's called Technical Account Management. It's part of the customer success organization. That's another way, it, that's a human business, but it's fascinating, right? We put these terms on clients and have them work, to work, work together. They understand the business. It's an old business, but trust me, having still a human in there understanding, okay, this is customer X, Y, Z, yeah. that's their business objective. I talked about this today as well. Not to forget, hey, this customer actually wants to do whatever, whatever, on the business, like, you know, like an SAP life go to actually take that further to actually a support case. And doing that, the team helps quite a bit. And then also the commitment, right, as in, you know, like, we don't want just to do support cases and then that's why you renew with Red Hat. We want to make sure you actually get value out of it and that's why you want to renew, right? And so that's why we configured different. And, you know, it's, it's bigger, right? It's bigger as in really, making sure the product is correct, so that's why quality assurance is in my team with support. That's why I run internal IT for the engineering team, so we run the stuff that we sell actually earlier, and some of my team is always like, Marco, why do we have to do that? Well, because we learn, and yeah. we give, I much rather have you feel the pain than the customer feel the pain, right? And so that's why we configured differently, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I've been 12 and a half years at Red Hat, and it's exciting that we are still able to yeah. change around. And, and the quality assurance yeah. piece is big too, because you're in there as well, looking at the QA, yep. making sure that's good too, so you get, you're testing out the products and doing QA, all within the mindset of 
uh, customer experience. And, and exactly, and you got to move that in the agile is more and more you see developers actually submitting test cases with that, so that's the component testing and the basic test. What we got to do more is what you mentioned, is like, hey, if somebody does serverless with OpenShift or container, that thing together with like some service, uh, software defined storage, that together to bring to get it work, that's the art, right? So yeah. I want to move more and more that we take use cases from customers, work closely, this is how we do it, like XYZ customer, and I mean, apply it. At the end that. of the day, it's the same game, a different playing field. Customer wants choice, best possible solution experience for them. You guys got to enable that and then support it and make yeah. it happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And with clouds now. It just gets and more microservices. And, and you see how, uh, yeah, well you saw the, de I don't know if you saw the demo yesterday when they show basically, I think Azure or Amazon was slower and every, every traffic got routed. This is reality as well, right? I mean, if you look at one, uh, one um, press release we did yesterday, I just find it a fascinating story. Forwerk, they have kitchen appliances. I don't know if you saw that, but yeah. it's, they have over a million kitchen appliance, there's a cooking appliance connected to the internet, and it's a German Swiss company. When they got to upgrade this system so they get recipes down, they actually spin up instances in Azure, in Alibaba in Asia, and I think in Amazon in the US. They spin it up, they scale out, all the appliances connect, then they shrink it together. And you're like, how do you support these customers? It's a whole different use case, right? It's great for the customer. Yeah. But it's uh, more of a challenge yeah, for you guys. Yeah. And they but again, with it. preparation, with the right integration testing before, with the right setup that we know, hey, this is what the customer is doing this week. And Amadeus as well talked uh, at the keynote, right? We worked a long time with Amadeus. Yeah. They're as, a smart team. Yeah, as part of your customer role, you were involved with the, the Innovation Awards. They were up on stage this morning. Uh, what struck me was they were both about time to value and, and uh, speed of deployment as well as scale, right? Often these were global companies, like we, we had Amadeus on yeah. yesterday, uh, you know, spanning the globe, huge number of transactions. Anything stand out to you in those innovation awards this year and may, perhaps maybe that's been different in previous I think, years? Uh, I, I think uh, the, the scale is actually interesting that you say, I think we have much quicker now, I think that's also technology matures. I think we used to have more smaller skunk work projects and getting to a certain scale, but um, it, it, it just goes faster. I, I think, well I think the cultural piece is probably a bit more accepted, right? This whole containerization is not magic anymore. I think it, a lot is being moved, uh, is coming from the development side, but also from the Linux side. So I think there's a less struggle of that. But I do see still some cultural struggles. You talk to customers, maybe not the Innovation Award winners, but even them, they say, hey, it took us a long time to convince internal structures hey, how we change things around. But uh, right, it, talk about it, the open source role, because you mentioned there before we came on about you guys are all in the open with open source. Is there like a project that you're part of that supports Centric? Is there certain things you're picking out of open source as you guys do the QA and build your own stuff? Yeah, we do, we do a lot. We submit a lot to, to basically the open. There's, a, there's very few, I mean, we don't share data. Like, I, we can't share customer data yeah. for obvious reasons. But like, tooling, most of the tooling we share, if it's like data collectors, uh, you know, like we are an open source world. There is not much that we don't, there's nothing proprietary, right? Is a, and engineers, that's why they're coming to Red Hat. That's the configuration. They want to see, hey, how does this stuff get applied, right? And they own the packages, right? And some stuff we ship, right? If it's uh, tied to the customer portal, the AI pieces, maybe we open source parts of it, but... Uh, but uh, what's it like this year for the folks watching who couldn't make it? What's the, what's the vibe here? at uh, Red Hat Summit 2018. What's the hallway conversations like? What's some of the dinners? What's, what, are you, what are you talking about? What's, what's the chatter? I think the big chatter for me is kind of like, there's OpenShift, containers, agile development, and, the, and then you know, the agile development comes back and back, and really like, how do we do this right? And that connects, obviously, how do you take application, develop them, or how do you take the applications put them in a, in a container, that is the, the why, that's what I, and, and then you see these demos, right, that with yeah. multi-cloud. Yeah, new applications, it's not standalone Linux yeah. anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. so Management I think software, that's, the enablement, the enablement that we have with containers and then to be able to run public cloud or multi-cloud, on-premise, 
it's the options are endless. And I think that's the strength from Red Hat. We, we, pro, we proved that with Linux, we can have a solid API, we don't screw up the applications. And if we can guarantee that across the four footprints, that's, I mean, Paul's vision five, six years ago, and I think we are there. And so, yeah. You talked about a bit of a cultural shift. How can Red Hat help its customers uh, come up to speed? And or, I, I don't know, that's a little bit pejorative. Maybe, you know, but be more, be more, uh, be more agile, be more, you know. Yeah, it's a good, good example. Uh, I think we do a lot of these sessions. I actually think even our sales motion, they are pretty aware what open source is, what the culture is. Um, they do a lot of these sessions with customers. Jim Whitehurst is actually awesome when he comes to clients. We did a, a C-level event at a bank. Uh, I'm based in Zurich and it was in a, in a Swiss bank. And I think they got like 140 C-level you know, CIOs, group CIOs. And Jim did a talk about the open organization, about breaking down the barriers, right? And that's, I think, is a role that we play. It's not, I think, well, some is Red Hat's role, but uh, it's, it's, we got to do that stuff because uh, we can share quite a bit on how we are configured, how we are different. I think that kind of thing is high on all this, every CIO's list of agendas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, and everything in the open is proven. Open is winning. Open beats closed. Pretty much every time there's now it's yeah. pretty standard. Yeah. Operating wise, you're starting to see people operationalize it. Not just for software development, but, but as I, a practice. I actually think for practice and how to run the company. I mean, some stuff is, is transparency, right? Yeah. It's like, if you work in a company that you're not transparent with your associates, can you really do this in 2018? Is that pain, oh. right? Yeah. Is that, and so I think those are elements that I, I think we do well at Red Hat. And we got to keep internally as well reminding ourselves these, these core principles from open source are really important and for And you guys company. are hiring, so you're bringing new Red Hatters in, so. Yeah, yeah with the yeah. rate we're hiring, it's, <laughs> it's actually it's a big concern. How do we maintain this culture, right? This yeah. meritocracy, it's not always polite, but it's the way we, we <laughs> function. Uh, you guys uh, are humble, it's good. You're playing the long game. I love that about yeah, Red Hat. Yeah. So congratulations, Marco. Thanks for coming on theCUBE, sharing you very much. your insights. Yeah. It's theCUBE live here in San Francisco for Red Hat Summit 2018 here in Moscone West. I'm John Furrier with John Troyer. Stay with us for more live coverage after this short break. <laughs>